You know, for the past few weeks, I've been begging and pleading with AEW to do more to balance out the presentation of their show. It's not just about the moves and the matches. You need more. There has to be more, especially when you are trying to grow your audience, assuming you are trying to grow your audience. And by God, the first five minutes alone of this week's show just set the tone for me. And I have to say, out of the five episodes of Dynamite so far, this was easily, overall, my favorite one. The first one had some big things. It felt big league. You could tell they were trying. The past couple of weeks, been down a little bit. That third week show I absolutely hated. Last week's was a little better, but still had some significant issues. But this week, only a couple of small things for me to gripe about. I enjoyed this show so much because the presentation was much more properly balanced out. You started doing things that were different than the moves in the matches. Like you look at Tony Schiavone, picking up Cody Rhodes, um, and that whole thing, just here's Tony Schiavone, fans know who he is, here's Cody Rhodes, the guy who's going to be challenging for the world championship at full gear on Saturday, November 9th. It makes sense. And you're picking them up and you're bringing them to the arena for the contract signing, so you're hyping up something that goes on later on in the night. You just so much about this really worked. That opening there, that first two minutes or so, felt really big league. It felt really, truly big league. And I really enjoyed it. And then doubling back from that and giving us that recap of what happened last week with John Moxley and Pac and the time limit draw. And then Moxley going backstage and getting into it with Tony Khan, who you don't see on camera. Interesting way, potentially, to reveal Tony Khan as an on-screen character in the future. And again, setting the tone for Moxley and what he's looking to do later on in the show and also at full gear on November 9th against Kenny Omega. The first five minutes or so of this show just felt outstanding because it was so different to what W or excuse me AEW AEW typically does. It's we're gonna dive straight into a match. Well they did something else this time and it made such a big difference. And even with the first match, Hangman Page versus Sammy Guevara, you know, I look at this, here's a bullet club elite guy and hangman page, whatever. Here is your inner circle guy, Sammy Guevara. They should be wrestling each other. They should be feuding with each other. And while if you're going to go down the hangman page being a cowboy type of act, I would like to see him wearing a cowboy hat and have a flask in his trunks and a lasso and whatever the hell. It, 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 I could overlook that for the time being. But I like this match in the sense of where well, the past few weeks it's just been guys going out there and crash test dummying all the hell over the place. And there really wasn't a purpose or reason for it. This time, this match was structured a little bit differently. And the key spot to me was when Sammy Guevara could have done something spectacular off of the top rope and done a move that everybody else does. But instead, he jumps down and bitch slaps the hell out of Hangman Page. At that moment in time, that is something that every single member of the audience can relate to. They understand and they get. You just took that man's dignity by pimp slapping his ass. Sammy Guevara instantly hated. Crowd instantly behind Hangman Page even more. A clear-cut heel-face dynamic. Hence, the match really worked. Hangman Page wins. Afterwards, the promo ends. Hangman Page promo. Not all that impressive. But the cowboy shit... You know, catchphrase is cool for him. Now, what I would like to caution against is the overuse of that word, shit, with other people on the roster. If this is going to be Hangman Page's phrase, then we need to protect that phrase and allow it to get over in its own way and be its own thing and be something that he can latch onto at a time that he really needs something to latch onto and not have people three or four other times throughout the course of the show every week saying the same damn word. It's just in general. You know, like, as you get older, it becomes cool to cuss. But if you cuss too much, it's not cool anymore. Same principle applies here. 
But one thing I didn't like, though, was this uh, Shauna versus uh, Hikaru Shida match. Why does this matter? Who are they? Why should we care? It's these types of matches. It's like they're trying to appease people by featuring women on the show, but the women really aren't that big of a deal. They don't really have much of appeal, and there's not really much of a reason to care about them. And this match was pretty lame. This women's division of AEW really needs somebody notable. They need somebody that can bring a little bit of flair and a little bit of star power to them. And they don't have that right now, in my humble opinion. And it most certainly is not Brandy the Bitch Witch. I don't know what the hell that was. What the hell was that? Like, that was all types of cringe. And you know what it was. The stupid little... Last week, the hell is that? And then this week, this? Like, it's intriguing in the sense of train wrecks and botches and epic fails can be intriguing. But intriguing is at least something that will give you that. But do we really need her on TV right now? Mm, don't know that. But if she's who you're going to push, so be it. Um, the next segment I enjoyed immensely. Here come the Rock and Roll Express. You're tying into the finals of your tag team tournament happening at the end of the night. So they're out here to present the new AEW tag team belts. And they look cool. It's Rock and Roll Express. You're in what, West Virginia. People know who the hell they are. You got Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson. Like, what's to hate here? And then here comes Ortiz and Santana attacking him and leave it to freaking Ricky Morton and all of his babyface magnificence 35 years later plus to still be able to get massive freaking heat on the heels. Because once this happened, sure you have those six sadistic fucks that like this and enjoy this, and I understand that, but damn it all, this got me to the point because Ricky Morton's so good and because the Rock and Roll Express are so good at eliciting that type of emotion out of the audience and people understand it, people get it. And the way they did this with Ortiz and Santana seems so low and so dastardly that AEW has almost put themselves into a position where they put me into a position where they've made me feel incredibly uncomfortable because, by God, I almost feel like I have to cheer for the Young Bucks now. What the hell is going on here? I feel like I'm taking crazy pals. And you follow this up with a six-man tag QT Marshall, I didn't know he was still a thing and still around. I kind of mini pop for that. I'm like, oh, this is ROH five years ago. He got the hell out of there, too. Ah. But the best friends in Orange Cassidy, this whole Ricky, or excuse me, um, Rick and Morty thing. You know, I was asking what the hell Rick and Morty really is. And some of you who explained it, I still don't know what the big deal about it is. But I just, I don't watch a lot of stuff in general that isn't sports or wrestling or history or ghost hunting related anymore. That's just the reality of it. So if people enjoy that show, good for them. Like watching this, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Like it's right before Halloween, so you got the guys dressed up. It didn't bother me. It was such a small, insignificant, meaningless part of the show. I just really didn't care. It didn't bother me. And it's clear that that audience, at least, really digs the act of the best friends. Like you got two things with this six, this three-man team. The best friends when they hug, and Orange Cassidy doing something. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of the lame-ass super kicks, but it's not like the guys really sell them anyways when he hits them, so it's more stupid and farcical than anything else, and we could use a little of that in wrestling too, because ultimately these are men primarily wrestling in their underpants with other men in their underpants, so how seriously should we really take this sometimes? But he is really over and resonating with the hardcore crowd. And that comes across on TV. So watching it as a TV viewer and not really knowing why I'm supposed to care about Orange Cassidy or why he's supposed to be such a big deal, at least when I hear the reaction, I say, well, there must be something to him. There must be. Um, the contract signing. I thought this was well done. Even though contract signings in wrestling usually aren't all that well done. Chris Jericho kind of reminded me a little bit of David S. Pumpkins. And if you get the reference, then more power to you. 
I, I, the blazer with pumpkins was something else. On the contract signing, you're tying into your main event at Full Gear November 9th. Now, sure, I could sit there and say because it involves one of the uh, executive vice presidents, they really seem to care about this damn story. And if you look throughout the course of the show, you look and you say, okay, they seem to really, really care about the elite members and everybody else not so much. And that's something they need to guard against. It's something they need to be cautious of going forward. I know we're only a month in, but those are some of the warning signs you see of, well, these things have to be changed and have to be a little different going forward. Nonetheless, contract signing leads to Cody's brother getting beat up by Jake Hager outside. You know, now you've added another reason for Jake Hager to be there. He's a hired muscle, and he's an enforcer for Chris Jericho, the champion. And Cody now has another reason, in theory, for people to get behind him. Although, with Dustin Rhodes, I, he has much more humor to me if you ask him on Twitter about his Black Rain character. Black! <laughs> the six-man tag, Kenny Omega coming out, whatever the hell he did. And it doesn't does really matter. I don't even remember much about this match, to be honest with you, as I think about it right now. It wasn't anything bad because nothing really stands out to me. But then you get the librarian's next segment coming out, and you're like, oh, God, where are they going to go with this? Here comes Moxley. He takes out the librarians, and then he does his pacing, angry, kind of schizophrenic Tourette's promo, and it was okay. Like people talking about this is one of the greatest problems they've heard in a long, long time. God damn, our standards have really dropped significantly. But what he did do, at least if nothing else, is make me believe that this meant a lot to him, this unsanctioned lights-out match at full gear. Like, I am now curious to see what that match is actually going to look like. And at least, again, there is a story here with Moxley, Omega... You're trying to tell that story. You're trying to tell Moxley's story. These are the things that I like. Now, I know some of the hardcore fans aren't going to be as happy with this week's show because it wasn't balls-to-the-wall, wall-to-wall wrestling. Well, if they continue to only write and produce shows in that fashion for your selfish purposes, they will not be successful. What is more important to you to get your jollies and thrills off of a limited presentation or having more variety and balance that makes those matches and spots mean more and have more significance that can potentially draw in more viewers. Like even when you look at AEW Dynamite's viewership this week, sure, it sucked and NXT sucked far, far worse. Part of that's going up against the World Series Game 7 that had 23 plus million viewers. But I promise you, if you do more shows like this, eventually it is going to pay off. You are going to stop losing viewers, and you may pick some up because you're telling better stories. You're doing a better job of making characters matter. You're giving us things that we can sink our teeth into instead of a bunch of matches where everybody does the same shit and looks the same and acts the same and works the same and moves the same. And then we get to the main event. It was almost kind of like it was a byproduct of the night. Here's the finals, SCU versus the Lucha Brothers, for the first ever AEW Tag Team Championship. They're fighting to become the first ever Tag Team Champions. And it felt like this is kind of an afterthought, even though they were the main event of the show. And if I hadn't had so many other good things to enjoy throughout the course of the night, I'd probably be crucified this company more for not doing a better job of building up to this being the main event throughout the course of the night. I got something over the past couple of weeks that bothers me a little bit. Is they're just kind of throwing out the main event. And they're not doing a lot to really build up to it. You know, if you want to be counterculture to WWE, and you certainly want to be different than WWE, and you want to be better in WWE in your own way, then one way to do that is make everything that you do have sensical purpose and meaning. There has to be a reason for it. Give people a reason to care. And again this week, they kind of dropped the ball with the tag match. But SCU wins, and I, I guess that's okay. I have no real emotions about that one way or another. I don't know that this match was particularly as big of a hit as it needed to be or frankly should have been as the cap off and the blow off to this tag team tournament. But I don't have a lot of gripes with it. Just like I don't have a ton of gripes with this week's show. It doesn't have to be that hard. Balance out the presentation. And my God, is it so much more of a pleasurable, enjoyable watch and viewing experience. And that's exactly what AEW Dynamite was this week for me.